Okay, we're going to get started now. Um, I can't hear myself, so I think it's probably good to put on headphones, please. Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a workshop, um, Solutions for Enabling Cross-Border Data Flows. Um, an initial announcement uh, from the remote moderator is we understand that um, some hotspots that you may be able to set up on your phones are causing interference with the Wi-Fi network. So if you've enabled a Wi-Fi wi or, or a hotspot, please turn it off, and that should help with the internet connection. So I know there's been some issues with that. Um, You can hear. Can anyone else hear? Oh, channel three, I understand. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Channel three. So we're going to start now. Again, this is on enabling cross-border data flows, and this is really an issue that has been a hot topic of discussion at the past few IGF meetings. We started to see more interest in cloud computing and the impact that that was having on, on policy developments. And I think it, it really emerged as first, uh, how do we understand what's happening and what are the impacts of cloud computing in terms of the types of data transfers that are being enabled. Then I think we started to talk about some of the potential barriers and policy concerns that are triggered by these cross-border data flows, privacy and security issues. And the, the goal of this workshop is to start to take the discussion to the next step, which is let's identify some solutions and positive trends that we see in enabling, promoting, and uh, facilitating more cross-border data flow, which is so important to both new, new types of services, but uh, as well as the free flow of information, freedom of expression, and, and, and social development, as well as economic development. So we have a great panel today, and we're going to avoid having a, a extended round of opening comments. So I'm going to ask an initial question of the panelists, and then we're going to turn it over to, uh, to all of you to interact with the panel, as well as uh, Kevin Bankston of CDT, who's here as our lead discussant, to ask provocative questions and add some commentary along the way. Um, so that said, we're going to start with um, Maria Hall, who's with the Ministry of Enterprise, Energy, and Communications with the government of Sweden. And so, Maria, you can provide us with a, a government perspective on these cross-border data and cloud computing issues. And um, I know sometimes we think about governments as only being concerned about these developments, but perhaps you could start by talking about, um, you know, are governments also viewing these as opportunities? And are things that governments thinking about in terms of how to enable um, cross-border data flows? Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much. You know, it's, it's, it's a bit weird to speak to <laughs> this directly, but anyway, uh, I, I try to do that anyway. So thank you so much for, for inviting me to participate in this uh, panel debate. Uh, and uh, for sure, you said it yourself, actually, it's the word opportunity. And I think the government has a lot of roles, actually, to, to enable the development of all sorts of development. But, but if you talk uh, specifically to this um, cross-border data flows, I think actually and that is so so obvious after this one and a half day at the IGF meeting that we are going into a new world. We are moving into new uh, hardware, new software, new services, new ways of using all the services. And I think one of the most important things actually for us governments is actually also moving into that new world, being users of all the new technology, both the software but also the hardware and, and, and everything. So uh, I think because the governments are also uh, in charge of all the agencies, we're kind of a large entity, actually. So doing good procurement and actually buy new services and have demands for security and integrity and, and all of these important aspects that we have for, for these new services, we did I think that is a very good and, and, and uh, important driver that we some sometimes actually, actually forget. And... Uh, I will not go into the, uh, talk so much about regulation right now, but of course, have a balance in the regulation is another tool. So there are a bunch of tools actually, and, and I just mentioned two of them now. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Maria. Our next panelist is Meredith Atwell Baker, who's a senior vice president at NBC Universal uh, in their government relations department, also uh, formerly of NTIA, so you have some government background as well as now the private sector view. Um, and perhaps you could comment on, from a, a company perspective, um, how are these changes in technology and, and the growth of cross border data creating opportunities for your business, but as well as potentially some new challenges to deal with, with government affairs? Thanks, Jeff. Um, yes, I actually work at um, Comcast NBC Universal, which is uh, the United States' largest ISP as well as a large media company. And so I think we see these em emerging technologies kind of, we're at the crux of all of this. We see so much of the opportunities and these evolving technologies are, are really blending the ecosystems and the innovative services that we are able to offer are, are unimaginable, really, are, are coming to life. Um, it's really, I think it's transforming our economy, it's transforming our society, it's transforming our daily lives. And so um, I think as, as the, these concepts sort of overlap, it's blurring the traditional distinctions, you know, you can't tell whether it's commerce or e-commerce, you can't tell if it's online or offline, if it's health or e-health, um, it's really, is it the system, is it the network, is it the cloud? It's all kind of combined together. So um, really all of these services rely on the data flows and um, that data doesn't stop at borders. <laughs> it goes across borders and the provision of services actually doesn't even, here we are in Baku, I mean, I'm, I'm using slides and they're <laughs> confusing. Um, anyway, so we have, um, uh, th these distinctions are, are no longer recognizable and so that obviously presents opportunities, it presents a lot of challenges. Um, I think the ones that I, I would focus my remarks on really are privacy, the one privacy as well as security. Um, I think there are a lot of reasons for, for excitement, but again, I think there are even some governments that are, are tend to be reticent, and I'm not sure whether that's necessarily a, an unknown factor of, of what is what are calculating the potential risks to these technologies, or is it just a lack of clarity of purpose? Um, and then there are the people who are actually intentionally misleading and defrauding citizens. And so I know it's frustrating for governments and, and regulators in particular um, when they see the potential value of all these technologies, but they also don't know what to do with them. Um, I think I would suggest sort of in my experience some of um, the things that we're seeing that are working in these areas are usually based on um, giving guidance as opposed to actually regulating because that's where the technologies and the business models that are continuing to change and upgrade, um, that's, that's allowing it to be put to its new and best uses. Um, I see that um, largely principles that are based on frameworks uh, related to these topics that seem to be working very well. Um, I think the Canadian paper, which is on accountability and governance, is a really good example of such a framework. And um, lastly, I think when we look at these regulatory bodies and regulatory guidance is needed, we should really focus on the what and not the how. Um, wh what outcomes do you expect for the companies to provide or support? Um, but, but leave the needed flexibility to continue to innovate. Okay, thank you very much. So our next panelist is Malavika Jairam, who's a partner at Jairam & Jairam Law Firm in Bangalore, but also uh, is wears a civil society hat. She's a fellow at the Center for Internet and Society and also is a PhD candidate, so I don't know how you get any sleep uh, in your spare time. Um, but Malavika, um, coming from India, it's an interesting um, experience that you're having where data privacy and, and security have been very active issues there and uh, really a lot of discussion about developing a new framework for these types of emerging technologies. So perhaps you could comment on that. Uh, sure, hi. I think in India we've had this kind of schizophrenic situation where we've gone from having no data protection law to having too much, or at least that's some people's perception. So historically, we haven't had anything which has made it an interesting place to outsource to. It's been a place where we've had a certain competitive advantage and uh, you know, coupled with a very highly developed tech software industry, um, it's been a great place to do business. But um, We've always papered over the lack of data protection law by either using the EU model clauses and achieving contractually what our own legal system hasn't provided. But recently, perhaps in the last 12 months, we've seen more activity in this space than we ever have. Um, prompted by a lot of e-governance schemes relating to our ID card, relating to rural employment guarantees, and um, 
a general desire of the Indian government to serve the Indian citizen through a lot of e-governance schemes and deliver services in a more electronic fashion. There's been a lot of outcry from civil society and from the legal fraternity saying that you can't roll out all these schemes without looking at issues like security and privacy. And in the absence of a very robust data protection and privacy regime, um, you can't roll out schemes. So the ironic thing is that the lack of laws that actually made it a fertile place to do business has resulted it in being a great place for doing business, which now means we've come full circle where that has prompted the government to actually enact legislation to cater to all these concerns. So we now have a new, there was a draft privacy bill that did the rounds and died a very slow death, but recently the government actually set up a committee to look into whether India needs a privacy law and what that should look like. And that report came out about two weeks ago and it's uh, an extremely comprehensive report that looks at what the OECD has done, what a whole host of other countries have done and has tried to give an international flavor to achieve some level of harmonization rather than have India go off and do something completely different. And I think this will be an interesting space to watch because um, sometime last year when we implemented some amendments to our information, uh, to our information technology act, which dealt with um, security and privacy practices, there was a lot of concern, especially from critics in the US that we'd gone from one extreme to the other and we had too much data protection law and we were actually a lot stronger than Gramm-Leach-Bliley or what the EU directive required and that we'd gone completely you know, off the deep end. And the Indian government reacted with a press note which was meant to be clarificatory but actually confused things a little more and made people think, well, what is the legal status of a press note? And w it's what some people call privacy law by unreform. So um, we had the situation where they said, well, actually, this won't apply to the software industry. It will be an exception. So we used to have a situation where um, the data of foreign subjects was protected when the data of local subjects wasn't. We now have a situation where outsourcing, um, things that come under the outsourcing label may be exempt and other things won't be. So it's a patchwork and an overlapping situation where different regulations apply. So uh, we're hoping that the new privacy law when it comes through will provide some clarity. Thank you very much. Our next panelist is Christine Runniger, who is a senior policy advisor with the Internet Society. And Christine has been involved in some of the privacy and cross-border framework uh, uh, efforts underway in the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC which is uh, an attempt to harmonize and uh, enable cross-border data flows uh, among a large number of countries. So Christine, uh, what are the trends that you're seeing uh, as APEC has been wrestling with these issues? Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, perhaps I should start by clarifying. Can you hear? Oh yes, it's very strange. <laughs> very strange experience, okay. So uh, perhaps I should just clarify, yes, the Internet Society has been contributing to the APEX work on the APEC cross-border privacy rule system, which I'd like to talk about briefly. However, we haven't been doing this as long as many others. We joined this work in 2011. Uh, but before I do that, since we are at Internet Governance Forum, perhaps uh, as one of the solutions for enabling cross-border data flows, perhaps I should just say, well, one of those solutions is the open, distributed, and interconnected internet. But, but moving to the, the question at hand, and it really follows on from a point that Malavika was making, one of the challenges that we have uh, is that there is no universal definition of privacy, and privacy laws uh, vary around the world. Now, there is some convergence on principles and some agreement in various regions. So one of the challenges uh, that the APEC region wanted to solve was how do you take agreements across the region, and we're talking about 21 economies that have agreement on principles for privacy within the APEC privacy framework, but how then do you operationalize them and use those principles to provide a framework to allow the movement of data across economies whilst still protecting privacy. So what did they come up with? So they came up with what we 
what I referred to and what is known as the APEC cross-border privacy rules system, and this was endorsed by APEC leaders in 2011. And just this year, the US has become the first participating economy. Now, this is a voluntary accountability-based system, as I said before, to facilitate uh, cross-border data flows among a participating APEC economies while still protecting privacy. And it's voluntary. It's voluntary at the level of the economy, and it's voluntary at the level of accountability agents, and it's voluntary at the level of businesses. Uh, it has four main components. Uh, there's an intake questionnaire for organizations wishing to be certified as GDPR compliant by a third party accountability agent. It has rec recognition criteria for accountability agents seeking APEC approval, and then assessment criteria that can be used by the APEC approved accountability agent when reviewing the, the company or the organization's organization answers to the intake questionnaire. And then there's a regulatory cooperative arrangement among the APEC economies that ensures that the, these arrangements can be sought. So what we're talking about is a voluntary accountability-based system. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the challenges that, that they face is how do you take these principles and make them specific enough to operate across a number of jurisdictions that have agreement on principles but very different approaches to how privacy laws operate and should be enforced. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I have a, I guess a reaction to the initial round of comments is there was a lot of discussion about frameworks and principles, but also this challenge of trying to bridge something uh, with privacy that is a very, to some extent, cultural specific concept and how do we have enough harmonization that we can get uh, cross-border data flows while still leaving room for um, that di that differentiation that is uh, probably inevitable uh, in different parts of the world. And then Malavika, you kind of introduced another interesting issue, which is perhaps in some cases there there may be an incentive to um, to have a low floor for privacy as a competitive advantage for a country uh, attracting business. So perhaps if does anyone want to comment on what you think the prospects are for uh, governments and countries being willing to accept that in order to enable cross-border data transfers, we have to have some flexibility in how how these um, principles are going to actually be applied. Is it enough to have a, a common structure on top of it? when it comes to the US, uh, privacy is enforced through the FC by the FCC using uh, its tools that it has available from a more of a consumer protection uh, angle than in other countries that have more of a dedicated data protection authority. So the I idea and the flexibility that the APEC cross-border privacy rule system provides is that it doesn't specify how an economy has to enforce uh, the arrangement, just that it, that it has to be able to do that. However, it's also much more prescriptive, though, when it comes to what the accountability agents need to do uh, in terms of assessing organizations and ensuring that they are compliant with the requirements. So it's a mixture of both prescriptive and process-driven and flexibility. So I think the answer is going to lie in a combination of those elements. Yeah, I, I think that's well said. I, I agree. I think um, that's probably why the multi-stakeholder discussions are so important. It's why we're here. Um, I think, you know, there seems to be kind of a, a growing um, a growing force that really, the, the receptivity, I guess, to the concepts that, you know, accountability and adequate safeguards and, and flexibility are primarily the, the concerns that need to be addressed and the approaches that are, are working are, you know, providing protection with oversight and allowing for redress. Okay, thanks. 
So Kevin Bankston, you're with uh, CDT, which is a, uh, a civil society group that works a lot on civil liberties issues. And I know you've been involved in one of the challenging issues with cross-border data flows, which is looking at the issue of law enforcement access. And that becomes a particularly challenging issue from both a security and a privacy perspective uh, with cross-border data. So perhaps you could give some observations of what you're seeing in terms of um, you know, what are some of the concerns that are raised and have you seen any progress by countries being able to wrestle with some of these issues? Um, well, there are a few things I've seen. Uh, certainly, we've seen a lot of concern, and I was going to frame this as a question to you guys, but I guess I could ask myself. Um, it, uh, uh, the question was, have we seen specific examples of certain countries or economies avoiding placing data or routing data in particular countries based on inadequately protective uh, privacy laws and in particular laws about access by government and of course uh, the answer is yes uh, the best example being the United States where um, we've heard complaints from around the world where people do not want to store their data in the cloud in the United States uh, based on the Patriot Act um, and concerns about the authority the Patriot Act gives to law enforcement and intelligence investigators in the US um, we've been seeking to address that uh, my former organization, EFF, my current organization, CDT, companies like AT&T and others have been trying to address that issue by seeking reform of our government access related laws in the United States through a coalition called the Digital Due Process Coalition. And we have this year things really uh, started to heat up in our Congress and we saw a number of meaningful proposals uh, that we hope will uh, be taken up in earnest next year. Um, less. Uh, less hopeful is the situation when it comes to uh, wiretapping by our country's national security agencies. Um, many of you are aware of a illegal program of mass wiretapping that occurred under the Bush administration. There was a broad uh, expansion of legal authority uh, for the NSA under something called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act Amendments Act uh, of 2008, and that is likely to be renewed again this year. Um, so we are seeing a continuing challenge where differing concepts of what is appropriate government surveillance or government access to data is posing a threat to uh, cross-border data flows and uh, effective sharing of information uh, in a way that would be economically beneficial to all of us. Um, I, I'd, as far as what the answers are, uh, but to move on to a question for you guys, um, you know, a number of you have noted the patchwork problem. There are varying standards, both for government access and for consumer privacy. Um, I wonder, as a practical matter, whether we're talking about law enforcement or data protection authorities, they are going to seek to assert jurisdiction over whatever data will protect their constituents, wherever it is. Um, is it fair to say that the only practical barrier to cross-border jurisdiction claims is, is the difficulty in, in targeting assets or individuals on foreign territory? And if not, what, what are other barriers that data protection authorities or law enforcement authorities, for that matter, face when trying to assert jurisdiction over data about their citizens or relevant to an investigation in their country when it is stored outside of their country? I'm probably the person who, who least <laughs> should answer this question because I'm not a legal expert at all. I'm a, I'm a technician, but uh, I don't know if I, I really can answer the, the direct uh, question from you, but I, I think it's one of the problems that we see the debate we had in Sweden, for instance, in the data retention uh, legislation case, and also the, Swe the, the um, Swedish intelligence uh, issues we have had. Uh, you probably heard of them. It's actually that people are, are not really it's not really transparent or it's not really obvious who's actually going to be able to have uh, control over the data, who's going to be able to be able to have access over the data. Is the data enough protected, uh, both physically in the, the servers and, 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 in, and the hard drives and so on, uh, and who has, who has access to the buildings actually where the data is stored and where is it and this kind of thing. So it's, it's a lot of unsecurity about the whole system, which I think it's a it's, it's a problem with transparency here, so that is one one thing I, I think that's very important, and also that that it, it's a gliding gliding field. I, you know, we have a in 
Sweden we have uh, one the first step was actually to have uh, one certain law enforcement having possibility to have the data and then it then it, it goes to another step when it, okay now now another agency might have uh, been able to access the data and that is like a gliding uh, slope actually so i think that those insecurities actually how, how the whole framework is, is moving on and how how the government is discussing and how how things will end up actually i think that is that is a really really pro big problem i think thank you That's a very good question, Kevin, and it's a difficult one that many people are trying to solve. I think the, the, the first problem is, of course, that uh, before you even get to enforcement, you have a situation where you have different laws in different countries. So that's the first problem. Then when you come to enforcement, the second problem is that you have to start with, well, first of all, detecting what's happened and investigating. And investigating can be difficult because uh, some of the information you may need to prove your case may be located in other jurisdictions, and getting that information may be difficult because there may be laws that prevent it, uh, or just simply because it's difficult to get the information. So, uh, and then of course, once you have your evidence, let's say you have all the information you need, there are issues about um, what you can actually do to uh, get any sort of remedy or outcome uh, through enforcement action. And there are, depending on the type of law, and, and there are many agreements, as, as I'm so uh, what we see, though, is increasingly attempts by different countries to figure out how they can collaborate uh, at and cooperate internationally, uh, specifically for at the level of enforcement, uh, in a way that still uh, preserves the, the fundamental principles and due process law and protects the privacy of all citizens and, and so on. And that's a difficult, a difficult challenge, uh, but we do see increasingly uh, different sorts of agreements to facilitate that co cooperative uh, enforcement internationally. Um, spinning off of that answer, oh. Kevin, I was just going to ask Malavika, have, whereas India is looking at some of these data privacy issues, have you, are you thinking about these international and cross-border data, just following on Kevin's question? Yeah, I think historically we've had this sense that India is not a great place to litigate. So, you know, you have to find some other solution and work it out through contract because you really don't want to be having things stuck in the Indian courts. But one of the encouraging things in the new um, framework that's been proposed by the committee that's been looking into privacy law is to actually embed it into the culture of the industry and actually look at self-regulation as a way to actually bring in privacy in a way that maybe the law doesn't quite achieve. And actually, if you get the industry to adopt certain privacy principles and if you harmonize those with what the rest of the world is doing and you sort of hardwire it into the way industry functions and have certain certifications and standards, that that's an easier way to achieve it by design. And it's actually funny for me to see so many civil servants and bureaucrats in India who are not technologists talk about privacy by design, which is something about 12 months ago you would never have seen anyone talking about. So I think there is a recognition that if you actually go to law enforcement, um, it's a pretty rocky territory. But if you, if you actually tackle it through industry and through education and through bodies that already have buy-in in the corporate sector, that you have a much better chance of achieving the same standards as you have elsewhere. Um, a, num a number of the speakers at this point have commented on the importance uh, and value and flexibility of self-regulatory approaches to uh, uh, international collaboration on privacy to enable cross-border data flows. I'm curious about what you think uh, is the appropriate role for uh, non-voluntary uh, legally mandated uh, privacy protections, and I'll, I'll, I'll split that into two questions. One is uh, what role can or should um, uh, treaty organizations play in establishing international legal norms for data protection, uh, what are the benefits and risks of that approach, uh, and um, to the extent that the United States lacks a comprehensive data protection regime akin to what there is in Europe or, or in uh, India for that matter, uh, how important is it, would it be to cross-border data flows for the U.S. to enact some sort of legislation, uh, noting that we have had a lot of 
general consumer privacy bills introduced, but none of them have, have gotten very far so far. Uh, Kevin, I'll start with a comment that I do think uh, even in the U.S., partially because of the international awareness that uh, other countries are looking at, at the U.S. regime, uh, I think it's created an interesting pressure for understanding what is the U.S. approach. And part of that, in my mind, is there, there are privacy laws and there is privacy enforcement today. It, you know, it's handled through the FTC, through state regulators, but it's a kind of a complicated landscape. And I think over time, what we're going to see is companies desiring a more uniform and consistent set of uh, privacy uh, regulations, whether it's in the U.S. or globally, uh, at some point the complexity of managing different standards is going to be outweighed by the benefit of a, of a uniform standard. So I guess my observation would be there seems to be a trend of a desire on the part of companies to really say um, it's just very difficult to manage a business when you are managing with so many different types of, of standards and things. So the more that could be done on a global basis to harmonize as the word that we keep hearing today, if it's not um, completely consistent, that um, you know, I think the business need may may shift a little bit on some of these issues. So. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I'm not going to try and answer the second question, but <laughs> the, the fir and the first question, I, I'll just make a note that I, I think I see Sophie sitting uh, in the room, so she might want to talk about the Council of Europe's work on Convention 108. So I won't, won't uh, do that, but I'll just make the observation that probably uh, some, and this is my opinion and maybe everyone will disagree with me, but uh, some time ago there, there seemed to be a lot of talk about, oh, we need to be harmonized on data protection laws uh, around the world. That's the answer. And it'd be really great if it was legally binding because anyone, everyone would have to do it. And I think there's been a growing realization that privacy is such a diverse and complex specific topic that the conversation has drifted more towards uh, compatibility and interoperability of approaches. So I think realistically, in the short term, we're unlikely to have a worldwide scale binding agreement. However, we might, more, we might get very close to a more compatible and more interoperable approaches. And some may be binding and some may be voluntary. Uh, so you'll get the whole spectrum. Uh, just to mention one other approach that's currently underway, uh, in Africa at the moment, it may be of interest to some people that the African Union, together with the UNFPA, is working on a draft cyber convention. And that cyber convention does include principles concerning data protection, so that's a another approach towards a, a, a binding solution. Um, but I'll pass it back. So I would just add that I I think that um, maybe it might be nice if there was cooperation, if there was some consistency. Although I, I don't, I, I think if you, particularly in a treaty set kind of context, I think the risk of being something that's overbroad that inhibits the innovation, at least to my mind, greatly outweigh the benefits of the consistency of some sort of global harmonization. Uh, one more question, then I'll, oh. Well, I was just going to say that uh, so far we've been very focused on uh, differing data protection regimes as a key threat to cross-border data flows. What, and this is for any or all of you, what is what are the other key uh, uh, challenges or emerging threats to, to cross-border data flows that have you uh, that that are most concerning or difficult for for you and and, and your stakeholders? Very quick. Just to be clear, I wasn't saying that data protection is a threat to an I was saying it was a solution that the, a the APEC cross-border privacy rules are a solution for enabling cross-border data flows in a privacy-respecting way. Of course. I, I, yes, absolutely. I didn't mean to frame things too negatively. Thank you very much. Sophie Kwasny from the Council of Europe. Um, if I can say a word about our work, so we have a convention which at the moment gathers 44 countries. Uh, they are all European countries, but we have uh, Uruguay, which will be the first non-European country to accede next year. 
and several other non-European countries have also uh, declared the intention to do so. The idea of the convention is really to, it's a human rights approach uh, and it's minimal um, principles of protection of the individual. And actually, if you look at the, uh, uh, the bill, the privacy uh, bill proposed by the Obama administration, the principles which are there match this level of requirement which we have in the convention, which is really a general uh, level of protection. One of the key issues we have uh, uh, addressed in the work that we are now doing in the modernization of the convention is precisely this question of transborder data flows. Uh, um, the idea of the convention is that there should be a free flow of data between the parties to the convention, and when there is an exchange outside the parties, you have some flexible mechanisms that, sh that should uh, enable you to transfer your data. So that's the approach. Uh, we are trying to address it now, but to come back to this uh, idea that maybe uh, a global overarching uh, uh, agreement on what it should be is not that practicable, I think that the fact that recently some of the APEC countries, which had really in mind this, uh, this accountability uh, uh, ten, uh, tendency and try to go towards inter interoperability, the fact that those countries are no now enacting laws uh, and in the process of doing that, is also saying that yes, the m we might reach this global uh, agreement on the common principles. And there are really things that the convention, like our convention, which at the origin comes from the Council of Europe, which is a regional organization, but which already had, uh, 30 years ago involved non-European countries, I think it's a great tool that should be used uh, by more countries around the world. Thank you. Kevin, to answer your uh, question, I, I would think the two, two large concerns about why you would erect barriers to cross-border data flows, one would be that there's a lack of a technical understanding and a fear of the technology. And I think all of the developments that we're hearing about are a positive signal that countries understand this is in their interest to, to solve these issues and that there are ways to uh, establish accountability without having control of the data within your borders in the traditional regulatory sense. So that's a positive. The other would be economic incentives to feel that um, that the, a country may be disadvantaged if data is allowed to flow seamlessly. And we've seen some examples where we're, you know, we're concerned that there may be economic incentives. But again, to me, the more you have these regional type of agreements, it's kind of like a trade agreement type thinking that we recognize there's a mutual benefit to doing this and we want uh, our countries to benefit. And I think any country that views data flows as being predictable is probably uh, playing a very risky game anyway in terms of thinking that somehow they're going to be disadvantaged. So I think there are at least reasons to be optimistic that there's more, more signs of cooperation and building rather than necessarily more signs of new barriers to being erected in the future. Thank you very much. I think uh, one of the problems or one of the challenges or, or actually issues that can really hamper the, the, the development I think is like if you remember the SOFA FIFA d debate we had uh, was it a year ago or so I mean this kind of this kind of um, legislation or, or uh, I would maybe I'm being a bit uh, blunt or mean but maybe th the lack of understanding really how internet works and uh, not really sorting out what roles governments have uh, versus the industry versus all the layers in the value chain and so on. And, and, in s and that I come to with what also you said, that I mean, I thi really think this multi-stakeholder debates and uh, dialogues about how things work and how you make legislation effective. So it's not that we, uh, sometimes I, I end up in discussion uh, wi with my colleagues uh, that uh, of course you need to have strong tools to, to um, hamper uh, criminaliza criminal activities, but we have to do it in a very in a clever, ef efficient way. And sometimes I think that the dialogue between actually experts in, in certain areas and also the, the legal experts that's going to actually like le write the legislation, that, that then we should have a good outcome. But in lack of that the lacking of that dialogue, I think that is something that is, is, a, is a big uh, hindrance. And
So we'll take some questions from the audience now, and we have one in the back. Yeah, thank you, Chair. My name is uh, Wout Knappes. I'm a private consultant in, in cross-border cooperation, private-public. But I'm not so much speaking in that capacity, more as to drive the conversation. And Maria was in front of me just a little bit. But when we're talking privacy, usually I notice that the discussion always focuses on government. But to come back to the Ms. Yararam's comment about, about uh, industry, I think that the, the privacy challenges from industry are just as big for consumers and, and, and citizens as from government. So that's one, because th they gather data beyond our own knowledge. They probably trade in it or share it. And somewhere along the way, this information tips to the wrong side of the borders and the gray to the, to, to the, the red area where our data is being sold and used and challenged in all sort of malicious, intended ways. So in other words, how do you make sure as a government that next to keeping the privacy from a government side, also protect the privacy side of your constituents, your end users, etc., so that they're also safe on the internet. So there, I think there are two sides of the coin in this discussion, which actually uh, should be part of this discussion, because the role of the government, no matter how we look at it, is also to protect their citizens from harm. And we think it's normal when you walk the street that it's safe if you drive your car well, maybe in this country it's a bit different than at home, but anyway, yet police on the street regulate things. So how do you do that in a privacy discussion when you look at both sides? So that's what I would like to put to, to the, the panel. I mean, one of the obvious things is, you know, to make the remedies proportional. And I think, for example, when we had um, a situation where people were worried that with our ID card scheme, there was going to be rampant misuse of data and there was going to be scope creep and function creep, the draft legislation that was proposed, the, s the highest fine that you could have, the strongest penalty under the law, was if someone actually hacked into the entire central repository of you know, the data of 1.4 billion people with all their biometrics, the highest fine you could have for actually hacking in and taking away the entire database was about $185,000. So I was at a meeting once with civil society where someone from industry turned around and said, you know what, at that price I would have six, one in each color. You know, if, if that's what it takes to get, you know, the data of every single citizen in the country verified by the government, done to certain technological standards, with all of their biometrics, that's cheap. I'd have it, you know, I'd commit the offense. So I think sometimes the proportionality of the offense doesn't quite, you know, it isn't quite set in the right place. Um, the other thing is that you, this isn't really a cross-border issue, but I think um, there's a greater interest in a lot of countries to actually delegate state functions to the private sector. So for example, surveillance is often you know, outsourced to ISPs. You know, the government doesn't want to go straight to someone, they'll just go and get the data directly from an ISP. And we've seen the sort of chilling effect that that has on free speech and expression. So that's a little outside this topic, but um, it's, it's also one of the things we see where um, the way in which the government tackles the problem is so heavy handed and it actually attacks the wrong end of the stick. Other questions from the audience? Yeah. Yep. Yes, hello, I'm Nick Ashton Hart. I'm the Geneva representative of the Compute and Communications Industry Association. And I just thought I would bring up, because uh, many of you will probably not be aware of this, but uh, in, the, in the WTO context in Geneva, there is currently a 20 country pre negotiation, it will become a real negotiation next year on liberalizing trade in services. And one of the areas that is most interesting to negotiators is how to promote liberalization of electronic commerce more broadly. And we talk to the, the 20 countries negotiators sort of monthly. And uh, there's a real 
that we've noticed two things. There's a real interest in everybody in liberalizing so that there is the free flow of data because they very quickly grasp that arbitrary or seemingly arbitrary limitations on the flow of information are not free. Um, there's a lot of other ministries in the government who believe that filtering or blocking a service because you don't like what's said on it isn't. It has no cost. But the, the trade people actually understand that ensuring predictable arrival of data, allowing routing to follow the least expensive path and operate most efficiently um, has a trade value. Um, but they aren't th there's genuine interest in the subject. There's not much knowledge about how it works. Um, and I would say to, to those of you, I especially if you're from those 20 countries or if you're from countries who are not, uh, it's important to talk to your trade ministry about this. Ensure that they consider the other issues like privacy and the like, but ensure that they also understand there's, there's a lot of countries who aren't interested in free speech. Let's be honest. They may say that they are, but they aren't really. But there are no countries that are not interested in money and in trade. And so if you can ensure that people understand, look, you know, you may not like what you read sometimes, but if you want to be a, an attractive commercial environment for internet services, this is part of the deal. You have to create a predictable legal regime and you have to be a place where people feel safe in setting up a service where somebody might periodically say something that somebody doesn't like. Um, and we've found a lot of willingness to listen to those arguments even in countries where only lip service is paid to free expression. I think that's a great point, and I guess I would ask Christina, is, is that some of the motivation that you see with countries in APEC, um, whether it's wanting to engage in the discussion uh, or even wanting to raise up their privacy framework so they get to be part of that, that agreement? Well, I, I would say I would uh, agree with, with Nick that there is increasingly uh, recognition internationally that uh, facilitating cross-border data flow is key to development of trade and therefore economic growth and therefore uh, social and, and innovation with it within a society. And so you see this recognition appearing in in different places around the world. I mean, last year, for example, the OECD held a high-level meeting on the internet economy, generating growth, it clearly recognizing and calling out the value of the open internet uh, to the development of trade within the OECD region, uh, countries, but also beyond. Uh, you see it in, in APEC, the recognition that they need a trusted way of moving data around uh, APEC economies. Uh, you, you also see, as I mentioned, in Africa, this desire to develop a cyber convention to provide a, a well-understood uh, continent-wide approach that could then facilitate trade within the continent and, and beyond. Hello, um, I'm uh, Ko Fuji from Google. Um, sorry. Um, so, so I know this um, session has been focused on pri uh, uh, cross-border data flows and privacy, but uh, I was wondering if you can, um, if somebody can comment a little bit on other uh, impediments to cross-border data flows, such as um, export controls, uh, intellectual property, I um, it, it can be a problem, or, or security issues. I'd like to. Um, have a wider discussion if possible. Thank you. This is just a question. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for a very good question. And I must say, yes, I, th I think uh, those are aspects are equally equally important in, in talking about uh, cross-border data flows. And, and one of the things I, I would just would pick up a little bit, uh, maybe not a clear answer to your question, but what, uh, what uh, my uh, fellow uh, panel debater said earlier is that actually it's, a, it's also a gliding responsibility. We have a, a 
rather intense debate in Sweden right now, actually, and not only Sweden, supposedly, it's all over the world, but the roles of the intermediaries, actually. The roles, for instance, for, for a web hosting hotel or, or Google, for that sense as well, and, and Facebook and, and, you, uh, and you whatever. So, and I think it's very important here that when, when we, we need to have clear, it needs to be super clear and crystal clear the different roles of the different players. The different roles of the governments that is actually setting the rules, the law enforcement have their roles, and, and also actually the intermediaries. Because when you, when you start mixing those things up and it's not clear who is responsible for what, or who actually could, could uh, what do you say, initiate a certain, uh, I, I lose words here, but initiate, for instance, in intellectual property rights. I mean, who is actually responsible for, for if, uh, if somebody is breaking that? Is it the intermediary? Is it the internet service provider? Or is it the, you know, the, 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 the individual in the, in the end? So the, these things are, are very, very important that you're sorted out. And I think that is actually hampering the, the cross-border uh, data flows as well. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, Car now that you've uh, opened the Pandora's box and mentioned intellectual property, we, we might shift away from privacy, and I'm not really going to do that, but uh, just from a personal point of view, I think one of the, the challenges for perhaps for many users is trying to understand why the internet is global, yet uh, intellectual copyright, uh, sorry, m uh, media, uh, film and video and music tend to be geographical and restricted to particular geographical regions. A uh, classic example is I, I might want to watch something on ABC television, but because my IP address is in Switzerland, I'm not able to do that unless one looks for another solution, such as a proxy. So it's, it's a, a challenging to take what has been traditionally a, a geographical licensing model and then overlay that on the internet. Um, I don't have the answers, but it is a, a difficult and perhaps there's someone in the room with the answer. I don't know if I have the answer, but I would say that I've, we've seen a similar thing with telecommunications, right, where you had a very um, structured regime for handling compensation with telephones, but the Internet really dis is such a disruptive force for that. So it's a good general point that you make that privacy is one example, um, but um, there are other areas where the globalization of every type of service is creating these challenges. Um, two things that I've seen in, in a more sort of developing country um, uh, perspective is that one problem can be national security because, for example, India was very insisted on having research in motion submit to India having access. So they asked for the encryption keys to the BlackBerry system and uh, it's only recently that I mean black you know RIM have been fighting it for a while and now they finally agreed to set up a server in India to get around this and all of the telecommunication companies will actually have to now connect to that interception server that's located in India so that can be one threat to transport a data flow although BlackBerry assures its users that it's very committed to providing a safe enterprise environment where you can have confidential corporate communication but that's just, we need to wait and see what happens because that needs to be implemented by December this year. Um, one of the other things is sometimes in the developing world you have slightly weird cultural um, things to deal with. For example, in India, because we've had a history of corruption, uh, transparency is a very, very big deal. And often transparency can trump privacy and confidentiality. So when you have... Um, public-private partnerships, when you have a lot of data flowing, um, which makes sense in an economic sense, often you will have right to information requests that could reveal a lot of information that would otherwise be confidential, which could be a threat to people wanting uh, to transfer data to India. And because there's a history of companies taking bribes or of you know, uh, endemic corruption, transparency often becomes a way to get data that would otherwise not be available. So we, we have a huge tension between privacy on one hand and transparency on the other. Mm. 
you know, it's something we're still grappling with. I was going to just check that we don't have any remote questions. Um, I have a question about uh, changing subjects a little bit about um, uh, Dorothy Atwood from the Walt Disney Company um, about uh, APEX and how it might deal with cross-border um, data flows related to kids uh, information and um, is there any special rules that ought to operate in that context um, and um, are they managed any way differently? Challenging question. To, uh, what to do with the special case uh, of children and, and privacy? So the APEX cross-border privacy rule system uh, leverages the, uh, the APEX privacy principles, which are very much uh, in uh, um, si very similar to the OECD privacy principles, and both of those principles don't make a distinction between an individual who is an adult and an individual who is a child. But privacy is very contextual, as we all know, and uh, it, it makes sense when you're a business and you're developing a solution to not only look at the privacy rules that might apply to your uh, service, but also additional rules that may overlay that, that give special and additional protection to children. Um, so the, as, as far as I know, the APEX uh, cross-border privacy rules don't make that distinction. Uh, they work on the basic, the fundamental principles of, of privacy. that's probably a, a symptom of a broader issue, which is the more specialized the privacy concern, whether it's healthcare, banking, and those types of issues, probably the more likely that countries are going to be concerned about harmoniz harmonizing and allowing cross-border data flows, although that's a, probably a broader issue. Hi. Uh, hello. Does this work? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was just going to give you a, um, a status update. We have two panelists from uh, the Ivory Coast who are listening in, and we also have uh, one. We've got Jamila uh, Jamila Doneda from the Ministry of Brazil, who's trying to um, to join, but he's having um, problems at the moment. So we're hoping that we'll have him online in a few minutes, hopefully. So, has the participant from the Ivory Coast have they been able to hear the discussion? Would they like to make any comments? Okay, so we can take other questions from the audience. Jonathan? Uh, yes, uh, it's a little weird. Uh, Jonathan Zuck from the Association for Competitive Technology. Um, I, just to maybe say something a little bit controversial uh, to uh, lighten things up here a little bit, we talk often about the Internet being this rule-changing environment in which we need to all uh, step to and accommodate the new paradigms that the Internet brings into being. And it, it occurs to me that uh, the airways were pretty open at one point, and, and yet we found the need to regulate the airways. Borders were uh, open at one point, and we found the need to regulate borders. And so I, at some level, the sovereignty of nations is going to always play a role in the flow of anything into that nation. And the idea that uh, data flows are um, afforded a special protection is maybe something that a lot of governments are going to uh, question. And so, I mean, if, if, I, uh, if I stop someone at the border because they have counterfeit uh, fire extinguishers and, and uh, I take them away or send them, turn them around and say they can't come in, I'm not sure how different that is from preventing a website that sells uh, counterfeit uh, fire extinguishers from being made available or visible uh, uh, for purchase uh, in the United States, right? Uh, 
I mean, I, I think it's, a, it's become everybody's pet uh, um, demon to talk about SOPA and PIPA and, and to, uh, to, you know, that the, the there was nothing rational about it. And the reality is, is that there's a fundamental problem there of sovereignty and of pr consumer protection and that the, uh, I think that's always going to persist uh, whether the internet uh, is a, a special international citizen or not. I think sovereignty is always going to uh, rear its ugly head. Thank you for that comment. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I agree with you in, in, in some sense. And I, I maybe I wasn't clear enough when I was, um, sorry for bringing up soap and paper. I mean, that discussion is dead, hopefully. So <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a bit uh, stupid to bring it up right now. But just wanted to have it as an example. So of course we need we need to 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 do things we need to to um, you know force criminalization we we are we are we are get the perfect uh, or interesting parallel with with air air airplanes we, we now we have to do certain security issues which we didn't have to do before and of course I mean the internet is a part of the world so of course it needs to be things also um, issued on on the internet but the thi the what I wanted to say is that I think it's very important to do it in a right and efficient way. And that is not always done, I think. Uh, mostly because, I well, we don't have the dialogue enough with actually people outside government. So I think that dialogue needs to be more open and more transparent. And then we can move do those moves that we need to be doing and uh, with our pet internet. Uh, but we have to do it in a correct way that, that actually don't stop the cross uh, border data flow and other things that is actually go good for the the growth and development thank you um, so I think I think you're both right um, and you both make very reasonable points um, I think that there are things that need to be addressed I think Jonathan you were a little bit late so you didn't hear our opening comments <laughs> but there there are things <laughs> but there are of course there are places that are going to be you know there there are there are places that are going to need to be regulated. The, the law does not end because it's on the internet, but the question is to focus on the what and not the how, and to be specific. And I think that that's what we're here for, is to have partnerships among the industry and the government and the representatives of the tech, tech world who, as you rightly mentioned, were left out of the SOPA PIPA debate, so that we can all gather in a multi-stakeholder with civil society and decide those places that, that need further discussion and, and possible government intervention, and if so, how to come about to do that. What you said was interesting because one of the flaws that we've had um, in India is that because the data protection legislation that we have, such as it is, we have a patchwork of clauses that relate to it, because they were enacted as amendments to our Information Technology Act, they only cover digital data and uh, things that are online or in computerized databases. So you have a weird situation where if it's an offline record, it's not subject to the same clauses and the same protections. So the exactly the same piece of information, if it's sitting in a ledger that's handwritten by someone, is not going to have the same degree of protection as something that's computerized. So. In in a c and you know we don't have huge internet penetration in India, so w what you're saying is very relevant given that it only affects a very small per percentage of the Indian population. Most data actually sits in files and folders that are moth-eaten and you know chewed up by rats in government offices. And um, bringing that all into the same degree of protection and the same sort of sphere of um, concern is, is, is a challenge in India, and that's one of the things that the new law is going to look at. Just very quickly, uh, we should also remember that there are many laws that have existed for a long time in the so-called offline world that apply in the online world as well. I mean, fraud is an example. And we have to be careful not to uh, be tempted to want to regulate the technology rather than the behavior, because that's where problems are likely to arise. This is about an address again. Um, just to throw in a very provocative bone into the discussion. Um, 
we started off somewhere with with discussion on we're floating into uncharted territory which is a completely new world and look it's empty nobody has done anything geography on it it's all new last comment said well it isn't so new we have major laws that apply that's the same what one of the recommendations of my workshop yesterday on cross-border cooperation then being critical infrastructure but fill in anything that you like was start using the laws that you have and start wor stop worrying about uh, a, a, the big internet treaty that we have to build that will be the end of everything for the next two decades probably uh, discussing sensitive topics so use what you have the other one is and now I'm going to be provocative we sort of heard the big telcos the incumbent companies or the mobile companies struggle and try to get treaties and help from governments and they got a response saying guys you're a dinosaur well we heard another example here and the third one I'm going to bring in is everybody seems to take the opportunity the internet offers from the criminals to to industry everything the only ones that are struggling are governments so are governments <laughs> the dinosaurs here or are they having to adapt to a new world and the rest are is already way ahead of them so sorry Maria but I'm putting you on the spot Thank you very much. <laughs> you owe me one. <laughs> no, anyway, but I, I, I agree with, with, uh, with several things. Actually, the first thing I absolutely agree with you is uh, that we need to use the laws we have. I mean, internet is actually part of our world, actually. We, have we, we, don't we shouldn't create any spe specific internet legislation just for certain things. That is, that is not good. So I, in that sense, I very, very much agree with you. Uh, I also agree with you that business models comes and business models goes. And what I started to say actually in the beginning the, that the government you also have to take opportunities of the development as well as consumers, as well as industry, as well as everybody else. And, and uh, I, I could also tend to agree with you a little bit actually that governments could be a little bit slow sometimes. But on the other hand, I think that after working for quite a while for the Swedish government, uh, I changed my mind a little bit in, in that sense because I don't think actually governments should actually be guinea pigs and they should go for, 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 for what do you say, uh, solid solutions, which doesn't mean that they, they can't do new things, use social media or whatever, but they, they should actually uh, be a little bit careful here in, in that sense, I think, at least, at least in, in some senses. Uh, but but um, business models come and comes and goes. So coming to your last uh, comment about, uh, I suppose that you, you were referring to, to the Estna proposal. I was going to bring, bring that up actually myself because I think I, g I got a very interesting perspective, I think, from the floor uh, this, this morning uh, when talking about the proposal. Uh, actually, I think that the proposal itself, I, I think, is, is, is not good. It is not going to lead to development. It's not going to lead to all the things that, well, the, the, the organization thinks it will. I, thi I think on the contrary, actually. But uh, what, what was interesting in the perspective of cross-border data flows was actually that this, is this type of legislation or this type of, of uh, well sending money the, the, the wrong way, I would like to say, in, in that sense, could actually could actually change the way data is going to flow because maybe service provider doesn't want to provide their services that particular for that particular telco because because of this this um, other way of, of sending money from 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 actually service provider to the uh, to the ISPs. So thi this was an uh, interesting perspective. I haven't thought of that actually. So in that sense, yes, legislation in that sometimes can be if you don't think it through. And if you don't actually uh, um, also accept that things are happening, business model comes and goes. Actually, this kind of, kind of proposal could be really bad. Thanks. I wanted to respond as the other dinosaur that you referenced in your questions. Um, you know, I think it's a very good point that Maria makes, which is to some extent we as business have to adapt to the technology every bit as much as government. And while we may be a dinosaur as a telephone company, I would say uh, networks are becoming more valuable than ever because it's the foundation for you know, all, of the, all of the services. So, but if you try to squeeze 
the internet into your old business model, uh, just as if you try and squeeze it into your old regulatory model, uh, you know, you have to kind of accept the technology for what it is. And maybe that's an answer to Jonathan's provocative question a little bit too, is the internet is different in a lot of ways in terms of the practical realities that and challenges that it creates. And we can either adapt to that and think in a new way or we're gonna struggle. And um, I think you'll continue to see uh, many types of companies probably try to get regulation to solve the disruption that the internet is creating and ultimately you know it's very difficult to do that with um, the technical realities so. uh, right. there's another couple of more questions hello uh, Constantinos Komaitis with the Internet Society uh, in the context of data especially, we see lately that new sovereigns are emerging uh, that use data as part of their businesses. And I'm talking about the Googles and the Facebooks that basically their whole business models are based on targeted advertising through the use of that data. The, the question uh, that uh, more of a, it's a rhetorical question and if someone actually could address it is how do you see these sovereigns actually uh, relating to the existing ones, to the traditional ones that we know, and what sorts of accountability mechanisms should we create in order to make sure that this data is not being abused and is not being misused, because Facebook uh, right now, five and 10 years uh, and 15 year olds are using all the time Facebook, and we're not, I'm not sure we fully understand the extent of how their data, they understand the extent of their data and how it's being used, thanks. Should I ask my question as well? Okay. okay. My name is Jimson Olufuyu. I'm the chair of the Africa ICT Alliance, the private sector ICT voice for Africa. Well, uh, we're looking at solution you know, to cross border data flow. And uh, I don't know, I'm sorry, perhaps we might have discussed this. I came late. Uh, uh, next month, there is a major conference uh, happening and uh, part of uh, some of the, part of the decision there will be on the data, how you control, regulate uh, data across uh, sovereignty. So my question is, uh, would the proposal is on the internet, would that be a solution to, or one of the solutions to what we are looking at, coming up with some kind of, uh, ITR uh, you know, treaty has been proposed. Actually, Constantinos, when you asked your question, I was thinking, I wondered if Google wanted to comment <laughs> before we did. <laughs> Hi, uh, so uh, Cole Fuji from Google. So um, I think with regard to uh, use of people's data, um, first of all, I wanted to comment that Google does not sell or uh, commit transaction in uh, third-party data. We do not sell uh, data to third party. That being said, uh, we do. Um, our, our, based uh, our business is based on um, targeted advertising. Um, and so how does targeted advertising privacy issues relate to um, to uh, public policy. Well, um, I think that in the each country we do have um, personal data protection laws. Um, different countries have different systems, but many of them are based on OECD uh, principles. So um, uh, each country should have um, their personal protection data pr uh, laws, and uh, Google does uh, abide by uh, these laws, and uh, I, I'm sure that so does Facebook. Um, and uh, so, so these uh, these laws require certain uh, types of uh, notifications, um, whether opt in or opt out, um, and uh, to to give users controls um, and uh, to uh, make sure that these companies have diff uh, various uh, uh, systems put in place so that people's privacies are um, ad adequately protected. Um, and uh, I would also like to note that it is important uh, for uh, internet companies to protect pe uh, people's privacy data security um, because um, as long as security is kept in place, the uh, data is intact within the company. When there is a security breach, it, it is leaked to third party. 
So um, security issues is a uh, core concern for privacy issues. And uh, we as Google do our best, and we hire the best engineers and put in uh, best measures to protect people's security as well as privacy. Um, I just wanted to say in response to Konstantinov's question that we have an interesting situation in India where the usual suspects like Facebook and Google who are usually blamed for you know, perpetrating every kind of evil on customer data um, actually have a very important role to play because when we've had instances where people have taken offense you know, to things, to cartoons or articles or comments that might affect religious sensibilities or other kinds of sensibilities, um, we found that whenever there have been notice and take down kind of requests made of Indian ISPs or of Indian providers, because the law is changing, because it's so new, and because some of these companies are so small, that, you know, especially the little startups, they don't have the legal counsel in-house who can advise them on whether they need to comply. Plus, people are a little nervous about the laws being new, so they tend to over-comply just because they're, they're a little nervous of being on the wrong side of the government. Whereas companies like Facebook and Google, because they've done this in so many countries, and because they have a whole host of resources available to them, actually end up playing unwittingly or intentionally a pretty important role in actually shaping the public debate around privacy and around autonomy because they're the ones who can afford to turn around to an Indian court or to an Indian authority and say we're not going to do this. We've never done it in any country and we're not going to start now. And uh, Or they can you know, assert the fact that they're not subject to Indian jurisdiction and take that kind of cop out and say well we're not going to do this. Um, and then you, you end up having a pretty robust debate around whether they want to operate in India, whether people feel their data is protected. So it actually ends up being a much more nuanced and much more interesting debate, and it raises it, it raises the profile of the debate in a way that it wouldn't if it were some small company. You know, anything with Facebook and Google in it is front page news. So I think these companies actually end up having a pretty interesting role in promoting free speech, whether or not they like it, even though they may be mining data in other ways. Thank you very much. If I may just comment on, uh, on the previous intervention. Um, the, the beauty of the IGF is the global, uh, global discussion, but there are some regional differences. You mentioned the OECD and the fact that the laws in Google, uh, Google's policy respect the OECD certainly, but in Europe there are stronger, there are stronger laws uh, in, the in data protection. And um, um, the 27 data protection authorities uh, um, coordinating their action uh, with the French Data Protection Authority as the lead have just uh, been writing to Google uh, about the fact that precisely the, the policy doesn't fully, uh, fully respect the European system. And there I don't speak on behalf of the Council of Europe, it's really the EU uh, scheme I want to point out. And it's the same for Facebook and Max Schrems, an Austrian student, has been, uh, has been putting this in light too. Thank you. Uh, I'm Barbara Warner with the U.S. Council for International Business, and I have a question concerning APEC. Um, they've reached some important milestones here with um, the inclusion of uh, the certification of the United States in the cross-border privacy system. Um, what do you see as next steps or next not milestones um, w in addition to simply at getting more and more countries involved in this system? Uh, I understand that there is work uh, underway to, uh, again, provide a system of voluntary certification for data processors. Um, is that aimed at as enhancing the credibility of this model, perhaps, per perhaps serve as an alternative or, or, um, or a successful example to the EU of how interoperability can work? And, and also, is there an effort to bring the EU to the table in these discussions? Wow, that was a lot of questions in one. Uh, so uh, perhaps taking the last question first, and I, I hope I'll remember them all. So the, the one of the interesting things to look at is whether we can map the APEC cross-border privacy rules systems to other uh, 
approaches that appear elsewhere in around the world, and one of those is the uh, um, BCR, the binding cross-border rules uh, in Europe. And so, in other words, not to make uh, everyone do exactly the same thing, but to see whether what other regions were doing is uh, regions were doing are compatible. So there's some work to to do that because it would obviously be uh, useful to have a cross-border system that is as extensive as possible if we want to enable the, the level of global transactions that we want to do. Uh, then I think there was a question about milestones. I think, what next? Oh, what's next? So, uh, so yes, important milestone is uh, firstly the, the launch of the system and then the US has become, as was pointed out, has become the first uh, participating economy. Uh, obviously, if we want to be this to be cross-border, it would be useful to have uh, as many economies participating as possible. At least two is <laughs> enough. Uh, it's also an ex another important milestone is the approval of accountability agents. So hopefully there will be interested uh, private sector or public-private merged partnership uh, organisations uh, seeking uh, to fulfil this role, a very important role with a great deal of responsibility. And then, of course, the next step then is to have participating uh, businesses, businesses who see this as an opportunity to demonstrate to their customers and perhaps to their regulators that they take privacy seriously, that they want to uh, be actively involved in Apex economy and hopefully beyond in a privacy respecting way. I think hopefully that was all the questions in, in that one. Thanks. You know, just an add on comment to uh, what Christine said is I think that's an interesting development is the emergence of governments looking to rely on private sector accountability mechanisms. I mean, you talked about relying on private sector in kind of a negative way of delegating uh, decision making, but in some ways, I think we're starting to hear more governments realizing this can be an, an efficient but also a flexible way to um, have some baseline protections without the traditional regulatory model applying. So, uh, and APEX seems to be looking at that as a part of the solution. So. Thank you. Yeah, that was a very good question that you asked, I'm sorry about, um, which I think we, the panelists uh, discussed probably before you arrived, which was there's a middle ground at between uh, no law and, and no regime at all, but also having treaties and international frameworks that are flexible enough to accommodate differences. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to maybe add some comments on, you know, what types of models should, as Africa is looking at how to enable cross-border data, what are, what are things that, um, uh, how can you think about this in terms of, of, um, of agreements between countries? So. Apologies for those who are already here. I'm going to say again something I said earlier. Uh, you, you may thank you very much for the question. Uh, you may be interested, if you're not aware, that the African Union, uh, together with the UNECA, is working on a draft cyber convention. And included in that draft cyber convention, there are provisions that deal with data protection that you might be interested in looking at. The draft is available online, and if I'm not mistaken, you can actually even pr submit comments, although the comment period may be closed by now, I'm, I'm not sure. And just in regard to the specific question I think you asked about, I, I think you were probably discussing the wicket and would that be a good place to have these discussions and I think um, this is a very good forum for those discussions um, be that and they continue to be ongoing but particularly for the wicket which is very focused and targeted in, in a very short conference especially for the ICU a very small short period of time I think that that probably is not the right place in, at least in our opinion to, to have that discussion I think this is a much better place and and I think probably to come out with guiding principles as opposed to come out with uh, uh, treaty-based resolution. Hello, we have one question from um, a lady called Cynthia Lor Kudian from the Ivory Coast. And her question is, 
what is the safety, what is the level of safety of these cross-border data flows? The question may be, um, how concerned as a user would should we be about uh, our data being, um, you know, transported across borders as we're using the internet? That's a really hard question. So, so you, you're, you're talking about security? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what the question is, whether it's security. Well, uh, I guess the answer is it depends. It depends on what kind of transaction you're doing. It depends on how your data is secured uh, from the point that you start entering it into a device to the other end point. And uh, different services offer different levels of uh, reassurance and security for data. And actually, I'm an attorney business person on our panel, our moderator, to see whether y you have any comments about this. No, I agree with that, and I think uh, we're going to see the emergence of more tools to help users protect their identity and their data management online from unanticipated uh, reuse, and I, I don't think that's necessarily a cross-border data issue. I think it's just a general data concern, but um, I, in my view, I'm not sure that as a user you really think about whether it's cross-border or not, right? You're, you're either going to try and find a trusted party that you recognize and know or, or you're not, and um, they may not think about it as much as governments do when it comes to enforcement. Well, we're getting very close to the top of the hour, so I'd like to give the opportunity for the panelists to give a few closing remarks, and uh, Kevin, you're welcome to as well. Um, and I'll start with Maria, and we'll just go through, and uh, no obligation to comment again, but if you have anything you'd like to close with, uh, please feel free. Thank you very much. Uh, I was, I just would like to say that I feel very positive about development. I think this kind of uh, dialogue we have here at IDF uh, is very valuable for 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 me as a government representative, as well as I hope for 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 other stakeholders. And I I also would like to bring this kind of dialogue home. And I would continue to to debate this thing together with my colleagues, actually, especially the Minister of Justice, who is actually in charge of this issue. Thank you. Um, I, I'd agree with Maria. I think that this is a very valuable discussion. This is a great forum to have it. I think that the multi-stakeholder approach of the IGF is uh, really proven to be um, valuable, and I think that this is the perfect topic for it, this. I think there's clearly a long way to go, but the thing we want to do is continue to see the innovation. So on the one hand, we, we, we need to protect our data and ha have these cross-border flows, but we also need to make sure that the industry can continue to innovate so that we have this data that can flow across <laughs> to cross borders. So um, a terrific discussion. Thanks to Jeff for leading it. And um, I guess in closing, what I'd like to say is in, in developing countries, I think we're moving from a stick to a carrot kind of approach where previously you protected data because of the fear of sanctions. Whereas now there's a growing sense that it actually makes business sense and it can actually add to your competitive advantage rather than take away from it. And I think there's a growing um, sophistication with which the debate is progressing and um, I think there's more of an acknowledgement that it actually promotes business rather than adds to the cost, which was the fear before. So I think that's looking very positive in I at least where I come from. Thank you, everyone, uh, for making this uh, a, a really interesting discussion. Uh, just to point out that we only had an hour and a half, and there are many, many other issues that we could have talked about that are solutions for enabling cross-border data flow. So I hope you'll go away and think about what some of those things are and spread the word. And just to also end and echo the comments of, of Meredith that uh, the IGF is a really excellent place have this sort of discussion from different perspectives of different stakeholders from all across the world. And thank you very much. Okay, please uh, welcome uh, and thank the panelists. Thanks. Very good discussion. <laughs>